<coughs> okay. Um, I think a few of you were already at the presentation during the FOSDEM. Uh, the idea is to do a similar presentation to the one in FOSDEM, but a bit lighter and a bit more in detail, and we can discuss a bit more things because I'm pretty sure most of you in, in this case are actual Godot users. So you're going to have more more questions. Uh, so we're going to do this more like slowly and, and taking our time to discuss everything. Uh, the subtitle is for the presentation. I left it out from the previous one, so it's not really what it is about. Uh, the idea of this presentation is to talk about uh, what's coming for Vulkan. Not so much the features, but what will get improved. Uh, we, are, we can also talk about all the new features. I have a document full of stuff. But, uh, but yeah, just discussing how Vulkan is going to mostly help the new, the new renderer in Godot 4 that's probably going to be finished by middle of the year and probably going to be released by a few months later as always. So it's pretty fun. Pretty fun. I made this mostly for FOSDEM and put some you know all this. Uh, I put some facts in here. The funny thing is this is like, when was Postman? Like in, uh, in October and from October to now everything changes a lot. Like we know have more than 1000 contributors. Uh, there's more core developer. Every time I make one of those graphs, like it's, it's, it's old after a few months, it's crazy. <laughs> like, like this team thing that it's, it says we have 680 overwhelmingly positive re reviews since Steam. We have like 900 now. 1,000? Yeah, it's crazy. It's, it's, it's amazing. Uh, this is for the Godot 3.1. Now we release 3.2. Yeah, it just I got this for, for mostly for the Postman people who were not uh, to use to Godot. But the truth is that uh, even after a few months, all this is old uh, and significantly old by the margin. I think the most interesting proof of that is what happened this year at the Global Game Jam. Probably many of you know that this uh, weekend was the Global Game Jam. Uh, we pretty much duplicated the amount of uh, games made with Godot since last year. I think we were a bit less than 200. Now we are 360 games, so it's almost duplicated the amount of games. Uh, if you look at the growth, I, I made a very, uh, maybe I have it here, probably not anymore. I made a very simple graph and I put it on Twitter about the growth of the engine in the Global Game Jam. And it's by far the fastest growing engine in, in I mean, for the jams and, and the indie communities. You look at it like year after year, it always duplicates, like exponentially growing. So it's really cool now that we, it's the first time we have the data to see that. The, because we always feel that the engine grows very fast. Uh, but we can't really see it, you know? It's, we have the feeling that there's more things going on, but there's no numbers. And just by looking at the Global Game Jam numbers this year, we can corroborate that we are still duplicating every, every. but if you look like, for example, at the Facebook community, it also duplicates every one or two years or, or a bit less than two years. Uh, for all, the, all these communities here, like Reddit, Reddit was just, like it, it says that it's 11,000, and this is from some months ago. I think it's 20,000 or something. It, it's crazy how, how Quick, this is growing. Uh, it's how much? 32k. 32K? Okay, wow. <laughs> it's a, it's really really amazing. So uh, we actually, uh, I think we have a lot more downloads per month also now. So uh, before going on with the oh, whoops, okay. Before going on with the presentation, just uh, was going to share you this uh, good news. Uh, the other good news that uh, I wanted to share with you guys, like. Uh, kind of like in exclusive. Uh, we had to talk with our lawyers, with our lawyers uh, yesterday, just to make sure we can say it. But uh, we, we got the okay, right, from Karen? Yeah. So it's okay? Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, okay, so Godot Engine got an epic mega grant uh, of 250K US dollars. So we are going to use, of course, this to... to <laughs> it's, it's good, yeah. We actually knew this from a month ago, but we weren't sure if we could say it because it was first too weird. Uh, well, it's not too weird. It's actually, they, they have a category which is for open source, which is not related to, to Unreal. But uh, the, the thing is, uh, we didn't understand the legal thing, so we didn't want to talk about much, but we got to meet with the Conservancy Lobbyists yesterday, so they say it's okay, we can just say it. 
uh, because we're still waiting on, on Epic to do a joint announcement or something like that. So, but they told us that it's okay to share, it's fine. So we're sharing that. Uh, but the funny thing is that, uh, not only that, but there's many uh, companies that we are discussing that they actually want also to invest uh, in doing grants so we can improve different things. Like for example, uh, we're talking to Google about uh, getting a grant to improve uh, all the Android ports, uh, all the under Android support uh, and many, many things like that. Uh, we're talking to Oculus, they want to also embed it's like suddenly the goal of this a bit on the map now uh, compared to a few years ago. So I think this is pretty cool. Uh, for us it's weird because it's just, we, you, we don't see the year over year grow. Well, now there's a lot more people than last year here. Like as an example, uh, we are <laughs> kind of overflowing <laughs> the Ludus. So uh, it's nice to see that we're growing year over year. Uh, it's really stressing to, to manage the project. You can ask Remy about that because uh, there's more and more people, more things happening that you need to keep track of, and more issues open, more pull requests opens. Uh, we have the new proposal system that we still haven't quite completely decided uh, how are we going to uh, manage it. Uh, the users are very happy opening and discussing proposals, but like, for example, we now are not completely sure how are we going to do the tax and the reviews, the approvals. Uh, we're, we got to discuss all this now because it's the time of the year when we get together. So it's very nice. Uh, at the same time, it's very stressing. Uh, we still feel that we are running from behind. Like the project is growing and we're trying to catch up. Uh, so well, let's hope uh, we can keep up for now. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of the, the introduction. It's very funny because I was looking at these numbers just yesterday and, and I, no, two years ago, two years, two days ago, and was just amazed at how much they changed in such a short amount of time. So well, let's talk about Godot 4 for now um, uh, this uh, I, I, despite me being the technical lead of the project I wasn't very involved in Godot 3.2 uh, I helped the guys fix maybe a few issues and review a few pull requests but it's most uh, the work of all the other contributors so I'm pretty happy that I don't need to get so involved for things to work smoothly so uh, I was fully working on Vulkan this year. Uh, I started working as soon as, kind of as soon as I came back from GDC, uh, which is like almost 10 months ago. And I've been working nonstop. Well, Vulkan is very, very complicated. It's a really difficult API. Uh, I think it's by far the most difficult one. It's way more, way more difficult than Metal, DirectX 12. It's, it's just really, really complicated. So it took my time to understand everything. Uh, it's now in a really good status. Uh, the Vulkan branch is almost at the point that it can do the same in the rendering as Godot 3. Um, a few things are missing. Uh, most of the features were, most of the stuff has been, of course, modernized. Like, for example, all the rendering is now clustered. So you don't have any more uh, limit on the number of likes like you did in Godot 3. You can put as many likes as you want. It's going to work. Uh, the um, what else? The, well, all the, all the um, material system has, in, has been improved. Uh, it looks nicer. The, the post-processing is very nice. The Glow uh, code has been improved. The, the um, ambient occlusion has been improved. The depth of field is amazing now. It looks really, really good. Uh, the, the, all the overall quality of the, I mean, not just we are modernizing it, we're just uh, improving the quality so it's at the same level of the, the top end engines, pretty much. So. Uh, the distance to something like Unreal or maybe the Unity high definition render pipeline should be much shorter now with Godot 4 uh, when we release it. So it will be not such a big distance to get the... I mean, we should be, be able to get really good quality and very high performance now in the new new version. There's still a lot of new things that need to be implemented in the Vulkan branch. Uh, mostly uh, all the list of things we keep back, like occlusion cooling, like... Um, I don't know, conditional rendering, uh, there's uh, volumetric lighting, volumetric fall. Uh, we need to improve also the subsurface scattering. There's a lot of long lists. This is why I think I'm going to be done with uh, porting all the old features uh, by, by February. So this month, sometime it should be done by porting, it's almost done. And then I will begin just uh, working on all the new stuff and all the new optimizations. So, uh, the other thing that is very interesting that is happening now that didn't exist when Godot 3 was made is that Godot reached to a point where we can approach the IHVs. IHVs is independent hardware vendors uh, like NVIDIA, AMD, Intel, uh, ARM, Qualcomm, PowerVR. 
Uh, with most of them, we already have a good relationship and we can talk to them. So now all the new implementations that are being done, uh, I can just uh, talk to them and ask them if they think this is a good idea. Uh, there's interest even from companies like, like AMD or NVIDIA to start using the engine themselves for their stuff because it's fully open source. Uh, so it, it's all pointing towards that is going to be really cool in the next years, but uh, it's still we still need to work for it to happen. So we, we just can't really get, as we say, uh, we can't ride the pony, as we say the, in, in Buenos Aires. So uh, the thing is, yeah, we still need to work very hard, but it seems that all the work is paying off so far. So it's really nice that uh, we see that the community keeps using it and more and more people are using it. So for us, for us, the, the, all the contributors and core contributors, we feel very happy that uh, we feel that all our effort was not in, in vain, I guess. So uh, you guys really, at least I hope, uh, enjoy their work. So once uh, we release Godot 4, technically we should be at kind of the same level as the big engines, uh, but we are going to do something a bit different. The idea is that Godot is going to have, well, I'm going to, to, to do it in the next slides, the, 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 the changes, I guess. So, oh, I thought it was going to hit the table. <laughs> so what happened with OpenGL? Uh, we made Godot 3, we used OpenGL, but when we made Godot 3, Vulkan didn't exist. The only open API that could run on Linux and Mac was OpenGL, so we used as priority. Uh, OpenGL is highly portable, it runs everywhere. Uh, it's, uh, we used 3.3 3 by the time, this was like 2017, uh, for desktop and ES3 for mobile. Well, it, it's, uh, it's pretty nice, but the truth is that OpenGL is dead now. Uh, it's been killed. It's not no longer in development. No company is actually investing pretty much resources on it. So OpenGL is dead. We decided to support an API that died like two years later. Uh, that was a big problem, but we didn't have any choice because Vulkan wasn't out by the time this work was done. So this is why the last the last two years pretty much no rendering work was done because since all this work will be like thrown to the trash. Uh, and remade in Vulkan, not much work was done in, in Godot in rendering. We fixed bugs mostly, but that's it. The other problem with OpenGL is that the, um, the API design doesn't map to how hardware works nowadays. It's kind of an old design for all the hardware. Now, hardware just works in a different way. Uh, OpenGL doesn't map it. So the idea is that, yeah, we're going to drop OpenGL, say for a compatibility layer, uh, of OpenGL ES2 that will be run everybody, everywhere, but will be uh, a bit slower, uh, but it will be super compatible. So Vulkan is just more more modern than, than OpenGL. Uh, it's a really, really high, uh, low level. It's super difficult to use. I mean, it's it takes a while to understand. Uh, I don't expect we will we'll have many contributors able to understand how Vulkan works because it requires a huge time investment. If you don't do it professionally, it's unlikely that you will have the, the resources to, to contribute to the engine uh, because it just takes so long to, to properly understand. Uh, the good thing about that is that, well, I will, I will explain it in the preview in the next slide. So uh, the interesting thing about Vulkan is that it allows crazy optimization. It just You can optimize so much. If you know how your engine works, you can wrap it very nicely to what you need and have a lot of optimization. So is, this is what I was meaning. So most probably, we're not, most contributors won't be able to use uh, Vulkan directly. Uh, we're creating a, a wrapper called rendering device. Uh, rendering, rendering device is pretty much like a, a higher level abstraction of Vulkan. It's still like kind of like Vulkan. It's kind of the same as Meta and DirectX 12. Most of these APIs, even WebGPU, most of these APIs are like kind of like the same nowadays. Their design is more or less the same. So render, rendering device abstracts this kind of design uh, of the modern APIs. Uh, and our default implementation is going to be Vulkan, but it's mapped a bit more towards Vulkan. So, since we know Vulkan will be our main target for, for desktop and, and mobile, uh, we will target it as make sure it's well optimized for Vulkan. Uh, so we're going to have like 
our contributors that like rendering but don't want to get into Vulkan will be able to use a rendering device. Uh, so we have many contributors co that contribute to GLES3, uh, so they understand rendering, but they just don't get Vulkan. So yeah, the idea is that this will make it easier to contribute on the higher level rendering, like for example, the post processing and these kind of things without having to understand the complexity of uh, barriers or staging buffers and these kind of things that are common in, in Vulkan. Uh, we are going to have a, the, the, uh, this is the legacy, Rasterizer GLES2. Uh, we are going to keep this as a legacy, which uses OpenGL ES2 and OpenGL 2.1. This will work everywhere. So eventually the idea is to also port it to Metal and DirectX 12 from WebGPU and maybe uh, Ariel over there will play, will port it to PlayStation 4. Let's hope. <laughs> He's a, it's happening, it's happening. So, uh, uh, but not, so, not officially, we can't make it open source. So you guys will have to arrange something with him to publish your games. <laughs> we can't, sorry. It's, it's impossible. It's not legally possible for us to distribute uh, or, or even create PlayStation ports. So um, this is the other thing that we will have uh, in, the, in the new renderer. Uh, right now we have GLES3 and GLES2. GLES2 is more for compatibility and GLES3 is more for everything else. Uh, that was kind of a mistake. So what we are go going to do now is to have uh, two renderers. Most of the code will be shared. I mean, just not going to be two renderers really, just two versions, two specializations of the renderer. The high-end renderer will touch a desktop and more or less dedicated GPUs because the problem is that if you look at, you take this computer, which is an Intel computer, uh, which has an integrated GPU, uh, and you purchase like a, an NVIDIA RTX 2080, it's an abysm of difference of what you can do with one and the other. It's just too much of a difference. So we're going to have, if we touch it like something that is too common, like if we, we make it so it's faster on the Intel, uh, the people who, ha who has dedicated GPUs will do like, ah, oh, but I want to have nicer FX because my GPU can do it. Uh, and there's a lot of users that, that don't really have good hardware. Uh, maybe uh, they, they are still students or, or they are in uh, areas of the world where it's not easy to get like, like where I live, where it's super, super expensive to get like good hardware. So uh, we don't have really good uh, GPUs. So uh, for those who still want to uh, extort the most uh, juice from their GPUs, the idea is that there will be a low end rendering device, which will be uh, a bit more limited in features, but will still look good and will be very fast and will run uh, nicely on your device. Uh, the low end one is also meant to be run on, on mobile because mobile GPUs are completely different than desktop GPUs. It's just completely different. Uh, Vulkan supports both, but there are features that like, for example, the, the sub passes in Vulkan that don't make any sense in desktop, but on mobile, it changes everything related to performance. So we really need to have two separate renders. It's just, just no escaping to that. So, that, so there will be two of them and the, um, uh, one will be high-end desktop uh, and the other one will be for low-end and mobile. So the idea is to keep them separate. They will be fully compatible, by the way. They, it's not like it's happening now, like for example with Unity, where depending on what you use, you use it's one thing or the other. This is just completely and fully compatible. You will, you will just switch and it will be, it will just work. Well, one of the nice things about Vulkan is that it has less bottlenecks. The main problem with OpenGL is that uh, you change a lot of states and then you draw, but to make this fast, the GPUs, I mean, not to make this fast, but just to make this happen, uh, the GPU driver needs to validate that all the states that you put are valid. So this has a lot of cost. If you're just, every time you draw an object, like you, you draw, I don't know, a tree, uh, and below, before you draw a rock, which is like different vertices, different materials, now you, you, switch, you switch to a tree. The tree has different material, has transparency, it's completely different. So when you switch from one to, your, to another, Open, OpenGL needs to do a lot of validation to make sure that all the states you change are valid. So uh, Vulkan, you pre-validate because you just pre-create an object with, with all the drawing state. So what does this mean? It just means that when you draw objects in Vulkan, you can draw like a lot, lot more objects. You just can go crazy and just download lots and lots of. Uh, just uh, draw lots of objects and it's going not going to take much of your, your CPU performance. Uh, a difference with this is that um, 
well in on mobile is the same so it's it's it should be more more about the same so the 2d engine will be optimized uh it's already much faster than before uh like for example when you use 2d like in single dot to be more compatible uh the algorithm just draws all the objects again for every light so if you have a couple of lights you have to draw all all the things in the screen again uh, this is really really slow uh, on Vulkan, this is easier because you have something called uh, storage buffers, uh, which makes it much easier to just put all the light information in one of those and just draw. So all the lighting will be single pass. Now you will be able to have, I don't know, maybe 50 lights and it's going to be fast. Uh, so it should be pretty cool. Uh, that, that will be, get a lot of uh, improvement to the 2D engine. Uh, there's going to be a new profiler. This is something users complain a lot in Godot 3, that maybe your game is low and you have no idea why. It's just low, I don't know why it's low. So this new profiler, you will be able to see exactly what's taking up all the frame rendering. Like, for example, you will be able to click there in this, this white line in the middle, and it will show you in the list of uh, steps of rendering which one is it. And you will be see, like for example, the shadow mapping is taking too much. So, so you will uh, maybe reduce the quality of the shadow mapping, or maybe you will just uh, use less objects with shadow mapping. Maybe you will put a limit to how far away the shadows will be drawn. Uh, this will help you understand how to tune better the performance. So maybe uh, the real-time glow illumination is taking too much because you have too many dynamic objects. Uh, so then you will use less of them. Uh, it just will tell you better what exactly is causing the bottleneck, not just slow for the sake of slow, which is one of the problems in Godot 3. Uh, this is quite important about Vulkan. Uh, Vulkan was designed so the API does zero validation. Uh, you can crash your, your computer with Vulkan very easily, especially uh, if you are running Linux uh, and X11. Uh, or I think Wildland, uh, when the driver crashes, there's no recovery. I mean, you have to start, a, you can log in from a terminal using SSH and, and restart the restart the, the system. On Windows, the driver crashes, but it, you don't really lose anything. Uh, it just restarts the driver. Uh, so uh, you see your screen black and then it's back. Uh, and well, the, the thing is that it just does, does zero validation. Because it does zero validation, it's much faster. And also the drivers are simpler. The idea of Vulkan, the main goal of Vulkan for, for the hardware companies was that uh, they wanted to have as simple drivers as possible because drivers have bugs always. You probably heard for years that AMD drivers are buggy. Uh, you remember this, this saying, oh, AMD OpenGL or your, well, oh. because drivers are really complicated. Uh, so nowadays this is not the case. I think AMD makes great drivers, but it took them a long time and it took everybody. It, it's the same for Intel. We also have a lot of uh, bugs on Intel uh, with Godot that were fixed, but some people run into them because they have all the drivers. So whatever. Uh, the idea of Vulkan is that uh, because it's simpler, it's less prone to bugs. So things should just work. Uh, let's hope so. I mean, if there is a problem, it's on the side of the programmer, not on the side of, of Vulkan. Uh, this is another really nice thing, uh, if you guys probably used uh, Godot, especially on mobile, you will notice that when a, no a new object that appears that hasn't been rendering before, there can be a stall, like it just freezes for a bit. Uh, this is because OpenGL just compiles the drivers, the, the shaders, whenever it feels like it. Uh, <laughs> so there's not much we could do about that. Uh, so there are some options that, that let you like store a pre-compiled shader, but the first time this still will happen anyway. So Vulkan uses a Spear V, which is a, like a, it's not a shader language; it's like a shader binary language. Uh, the GPU doesn't really understand Spear V, so the driver will convert Spear V into the actual bytecode that is run by the GPU. But it's much closer to what the GPU expects than the than the text from OpenGL. Uh, so the, this conversion is much faster. Uh, so that means that uh, the first thing is that there won't be uh, stalls anymore because uh, we just pre-compiled the shaders before. Uh, and the second thing is that uh, even then the pipeline objects, which are the actual version of the compiled driver for the GPU, can be caged. Uh, not on export uh, because it's different for every GPU or every driver, uh, but definitely will be uh, during the runtime. So 
but when the things are loaded, not when the things are running. So this probably will help a lot this uh, situation where you get a stall for compilation. So this was one of the most biggest complaints also about 3D in Godot. It should be fixed, I hope. Uh, another really nice thing about, uh, about Vulkan is that you can do a lot of 3D code. Like, for example, you probably noticed that if you want to load a scene on a 3D in Godot 3, uh, it's a bit slower than if you load it on, on the main thread. Uh, that's because uh, OpenGL doesn't really support threads. We have to send stuff to the main thread and then back to the thread that is loading because there's no other way. Uh, on Vulkan, this is not the case. On Vulkan, you can just upload meshes and textures uh, completely asynchronously. So it's much, much... Uh, I mean, you kind of can do it in OpenGL, but it's not great. Uh, on Vulkan, you can really do it per totally asynchronously. So uh, you will have much faster load times. All the resource loading like in Godot will be done on threads, which means that when you load a scene, uh, all the resources will be loaded in different threads. So it will be much, much faster to load scenes in Godot uh, 4 than in Godot 3. This is all thanks to Vulkan that lets you load all the textures and meshes and everything in threads. So we'll, we, you will have a much more uh, efficient experience uh, thanks to it. Uh, another thing with uh, Vulkan is that Part of the API, I mentioned this before, but I will clarify it more. Part of the API is designed for mobile. Uh, you can kind of not use it, I suppose, if you use it for desktop. The high-end renderer will not use that. But part of the API is actually designed for mobile. So which means that uh, imagine that you the, the mobile renderers are really different than the renderers in, in desktop. Uh, they are more complex and high level. Like you can throw a lot of objects, but then it's going to like divide the screen in like an, in a grid, and every grid then is its own screen and renders uh, by itself. It's, it's really weird. So uh, we will be able in the low-end render to make use of, of those features to improve the mobile performance a lot. Uh, so it should be really nice, I think, uh, for mobile users if you export. Of course, this is only for high-end mobile devices, not really for the old-end. For the old uh, low-end and the, the old mobile devices, you will still need to use OpenGL. Uh, not much about that that can be done. Uh, another beautiful beautiful thing about Vulkan is that it includes compute. Uh, on the free software or free APIs or royalty free APIs, there was this problem that there was no compute API. There was OpenCL at some point, but it wasn't super compatible with, with OpenGL. It required like different kind of shaders. And also uh, NVIDIA refused to implement the latest versions. So it kind of sucked. Thanks to Vulkan, all this is now perfectly uh, supported. It should work everywhere. Like, it works on mobile, it works on desktop, it works like slowly. So it will be really nice that that's pretty cool. But also what's very nice is that you will be able to use compute from within your game. Uh, if you want to make a game that has like lots of enemies or lots of whatever, uh, you can just run uh, this logic in compute and you can process millions of whatever you need at the same time. Uh, you will be able, if you want to make some kind of game, to optimize using compute. So that's going to be pretty cool. Uh, this uh, this is something we are going to change for Godot 4 because of user feedback. Uh, one typical problem in Godot 3 is that a lot of quality settings are just like, for example, if you are uh, doing depth of field, uh, the depth of field lets you have uh, quality, low, medium, and high. Uh, if you are a user, you will just go high because it looks better. And just why using low? I mean, if you put it low, high is just just better. Uh, it's not obvious that it has a performance cost. Uh, so what happened is that a lot of users just used a lot of very high quality settings in their games, and the performance was terrible uh, because we allowed them and didn't tell them from the interface that this is going to be like slower. So in the end, Godot got a reputation of being slow with because maybe many users actually just put everything to the highest and it's not very clear what's slow and what's fast. Uh, so for Godot 4, uh, we will move most of these settings to the project settings. So you see them all in one screen. And also, as you can see, we will specify if something is fast and is slow. Like for example, the depth of field bo bokeh shape. Uh, you can use a box, which is really fast, but it's a box, it's not very realistic, unless you use it for small kernels. Uh, you can use an hexagon, which kind of is expected from a bokeh, uh, which is faster. 
uh, and you can use the circle bokeh, which is the most photographically realistic bokeh, uh, the one that's supposed to be the most beautiful. Uh, probably only on dedicated GPUs because it's considerably more expensive than than the hexagon one. Uh, so if your game is low, you can just go to the project settings and quality and see if you have anything set to like slow, <laughs> and you can change it to fast. We hope with that it will be easier for for users to not just make that that compromise. This is one change you will have to do in Vulkan in the Godot 4. Uh, right now you have the textures and the texture have you can select in the texture if you want to use filter. Uh, when you make a pixel art game, you usually set the filter in the texture uh, to no filter or to nearest. Uh, this is no longer residing in the texture in Godot 4. This is uh, on the canvas item. If you have a sprite, you can select for a sprite if you want it uh, uh, to be filtered or not. Or there is also a global setting in the project settings. If you're making a pixel art game, you just go there and disable filtering and that's it. Uh, it's going to be like pixel art uh, for 2D and for 3D it's the same. Uh, you're no longer setting this in the texture, you have to set it in the material. When you're creating a material, if you're using the, the new standard material that we are going to make, uh, you can select in the end the kind of filter. If you make a shader for every texture, you can select the shade. When you make the shader, be it visual shader or, or text shader, for every texture you combine, you can select the kind of filter. Let's just move to the other side. Because this is how it works in modern rendering APIs. Uh, thanks to this, uh, you will no longer be You can use as many textures as you want, pretty much. Uh, before, you were limited to like maybe 32. Uh, which is still a lot, but if the engine also wants to use them internally for things, you're lim limited to even less. So with this, you can use like a hundred textures if you want, and it's going to work. I mean, you're probably not going to use as many, but you're not, you won't be as limited as before. Uh, and this also improves performance hugely because we can just bind the samplers once and do all the rowing without doing any extra extra work. So. This is the, the end of the presentation. Uh, I tried to make it shorter, so I'm pretty sure you guys want to know a lot of Godot 4. Uh, so the idea is to just have more time for questions uh, because I'm pretty sure there's a lot of curiosity about Godot 4. So, well, it's question time. So, hey, is it full? Oh, okay, for the live stream, yeah. So on the topic of pre-compiling the shaders, how do you know that the CPU is not gonna have some internal uh, bytecode and they're gonna need to compile the spear V to this bytecode on like when it needs to run the shader and we're gonna have the same problem as we have on shield. How about this much faster? Transforming from bytecode to from severe bit to bytecode is way faster. You can try if you want now on the Vulkan branch uh, with the material testers demo. You know when you look at the at the thing for the the, the objects for the first time uh, in OpenGL it takes like a few seconds and on Vulkan it's almost instant. Uh, and you can also cache that bytecode, so it may happen once at least and not going to happen again later. Uh, Vulkan lets you cache the pipeline state objects. So uh, this only happens once and never happens again. Also, one nice thing is that uh, the Godot 4 renderer is no longer doing a lot of, like you probably saw the source code of the older versions. Uh, they have a lot of if devs that you can switch depending on the material. Uh, there's are like 32 conditional renderings, uh, which means like 4,000 million possibilities for the shader. Uh, in the new Godot, this was changed because Vulkan allows like more dynamic uh, creation of stuff. There's no need to recompile so much. So there's probably like only nine shader versions. So they just can get compiled once and then you don't have to worry about like uh, having these problems like you did in, in the previous versions. So it shouldn't be a problem technically. When you're talking about high and low quality rendering, yeah. how is the user going to control that, or is that going to be done automatically with the engine when you export your project? How are you actually going to define what is a computer with a GPU that's adequate enough to use Vulkan, and what is a 
end result that's going to need to use the GLES? Uh, I think the idea is to do exactly the same as we do now with GLES 3 and GLES 2. Uh, it's probably better because with the GLES 3 and GLES 2 situation, uh, things actually do look different depending on the rendering because like for example, GLES 3 renders in linear color space while GLES 2 is uh, the sRGB because there are devices that don't even support the linear color space. Uh, in this case, uh, it's just a toggle that you select. The idea with these things is that you just um, you just select which kind of target device you're going to be making. I mean, not so much use it as a fallback, you know, because it doesn't make that much sense to use it as a, as a fallback. It makes more sense that you just tell the the your the engine, I'm going to make a game that I expect it to run fine on low low end computers. So you just set the low end rendering device. Uh, you can actually also uh, change a lot of quality settings and use the high. I mean, if your game mostly targets high end uh, as something that has to look really good, but you want it to run properly on low end devices by changing some settings, uh, then yeah, probably go for the high end one and just uh, make sure to add a, a quality setting screen where you can just change things that will go faster in older or slower devices. Uh, if you really want something that is super compatible even with uh, much older computers or mobile uh, that runs on mobile too, then just target the low end. You will probably miss a few features. Uh, you will be a bit more restricted because the low end render is going to use different rendering, so you won't have such flexibility with the materials or the light shaders. Uh, but uh, you will be ensured that it's going to be fast and it's going to run on, on, on older computers. So it's kind of like you probably have to think what you want to target before setting one of them. You could probably use them as fallback. I mean, if you if you target the game, I mean, if you make the game using the low end renderer, but maybe you want to use some of the features of the high end renderer. Uh, if you use those computer support, like for example, I don't know, you want to use the the um, uh, MSAAA uh, for multi sample anti alias, which looks amazing. Uh, this is only really for high end, so. Uh, the idea is that there you will, if you want to use it as a quality setting, right, you can still do it. It's fine. It's going to be fully compatible. It's going to work on the on the on the on the high end without any problem. So the idea is just more like a target actually than a. But you can use it as a fallback. For GLES two, you can't use it as a fallback because it just looks different. Uh, it's going to look like like crap on GLES two. So so yeah, that's pretty much it. Hello, thank you for the talk again. And uh, I just wanted to ask a question about specifically uh, compute and how it will be implemented. Like, will it be a compute shader and how will we plug data and get data out? Uh, there's two ways to use compute, maybe three in the future. Uh, this uh, new rendering device API uh, lets you access the whole rendering API, like the low level one. Uh, you have now, at least for uh, maybe for the Windows 4, you will have two ways to use it. Uh, you can use it on the render thread if you want, but you have to hook to a signal that comes from the visual server that tells you that the 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 render thread has begun working, like an like So you can hook to that, and in there, you run rendering code directly, and you write your own compute shaders, and you can upload buffers, textures, do whatever you want. If you want to make something really complex. Uh, and then you have access to all the um, shaders and textures that are already existing uh, in the in the engine. But maybe you don't want to do that. Maybe you want to use uh, compute for something that is gameplay related and not graphics related. In that case, what you can do, which is really cool, is you can create your own rendering device that runs on your game thread. Uh, that you can just uh, set some instructions and tell it to compute and wait until it's done. Uh, so this way you can use it for gameplay and don't worry about graphics. The thing is, the one that you use, use for gameplay doesn't have access to all the textures and arrays and buffers from the rendering device, uh, from the rendering thread. Uh, this is because uh, it's not possible to like call Vulkan common buffers from different threads. So you need to like uh, separate both. And the, the one that will run from user space, uh, from the main thread, if you want to use it, uh, it's just for game logic. So that's kind of the limitation. Uh, it's still, you will still need to use uh, actual compute shaders in GLSL, real GLSL, because we still haven't decided how to abstract them to make them easier to use. Uh, we don't know yet how to do that. We need to discuss it more. Uh, but at least you will be able to use it in the low-level API with full portability uh, without having to worry if you really want to use the... Then we may make a simplified way to make compute shaders uh, using our own GLSL version, which is more contained and... and 
helps you with code completion and, and all the things. That, that will be kind of the plan for now. Any more questions? Uh, currently, um, the quality settings are on uh, world environment uh, objects. Yeah. Uh, so that will change? Uh, that will move to all to project settings. C could we still um, change them in game? Yes, you can change them in game. You just use the Visual Server API and okay. change them from there. But yeah, you can change all of them uh, okay. in real time. Uh, I wanted to ask what will happen with the old renderer CS2 and ES3 after the high-end Vulkan and low-end Vulkan gets released yeah. and do you plan like to support OpenGL and other devices that don't support Vulkan? Uh, that's a very good question. There is one problem with Open... I mean, uh, we're probably going to keep the OpenGL ES2 renderer, not the ES3 renderer because of a single thing, which is that uh, on OpenGL ES3, or more like DirectX 10 level of uh, hardware, uh, there is one problem with the... Uh, when you want to set the color space of the textures, you know, uh, when you... Imagine when you are uh, writing a shader, uh, the texture that goes into Albedo, uh, you want to set it as sRGB, like, because it's, uh, it's means for color, <coughs> The normal map, you don't want to use, set it for sRGB you, because it's used for data, as an example. So in Vulkan, you can have two textures that share the data, one which is the sRGB version and one that is not the SRG, S, sRGB version. So when we import a texture from the editor, we don't have to worry about having, about which mode to import it, you know? In Godot 3, you have to, it detects when you use it for the Albedo channel, and then convert it to sRGB. But maybe you also want to use the texture in 2D uh, for some reason, just to preview it or something. And when you do that, it breaks because the texture has been imported as, as, as sRGB. So you show it on the 2D the editor uh, or on the 2D, and it breaks because the texture can only be one mode. There is an extension to change the mode in OpenGL ES3, uh, but it doesn't work in our hardware. It, it doesn't work in mobile, so it's not really usable. Uh, if we can... Uh, not make, I mean, the compatibility with OpenGL ES3. Uh, we have the advantage that we can simplify hugely the workflow for textures, like for importing textures and things. Uh, so probably GL ES3 will not be supported, or maybe it will be added, like many of the things in the GL ES3 renderer will be added to the GL ES2 renderer. Uh, so they can be like, uh, you can use more features in there, uh, but it will be still mostly a fallback for really old computers. If you have something that supports Vulkan, you should never use uh, something like that. Uh, for GLES2, it's not a problem because it doesn't even support linear color space. Uh, so you just all use them in, in, in sRGB like all the time, or more like in linear because it's not there. Uh, so yeah, that, that's uh, the, the reason why we are not keeping mostly, but also because Vulkan works just completely different and trying to still make things work the OpenGL way in a way that is not for legacy doesn't make so much sense. That, so that's... Any more questions, or are we okay? Some questions from the stream. Oh, okay. So most of the questions from the stream have been answered, but there's one that they ask about how difficult it will be to port from current projects to the new one, if it will have a oh. lot of raking changes or... Uh, well, uh, we know how difficult it was to go from Godot 2 to Godot 3. Uh, it was really, really a pain for a lot of users to the point many had to finish their game in Godot 2 uh, because it was really difficult to port. Uh, the problem with going from 2 to 3 was that uh, we made many, many games uh, using Godot 2 even before it was open source with Ariel over there. Uh, and uh, we just couldn't break compatibility because the games were in development and breaking compatibility would be a problem. Uh, we had many games in development and we just couldn't go and break compatibility. So when Godot was open sourced uh, for a while, we also still had our company and, and decided to not really break compatibility. 
So uh, this was no longer the case uh, when Godot 3 was made. So we were like, okay, I already had a really long list of things I wanted to fix in the engine since like maybe four or five years that I couldn't do because it would mean breaking compatibility uh, when going from two to three. So the work of breaking compatibility from two to three was absolutely massive. It was very, very, very big. Uh, from going to three to four, uh, there's probably not going to be a lot of compatibility breakage. Your projects should just work. Given you delete the import folder and let it import again, that probably is the only required uh, thing to, to pod the project, uh, mostly at least. But uh, we're going to do some changes to GDScript with George here, uh, which may require breaking some compatibility. Like, for example, one of the features we're discussing uh, for Godot 4 in GDScript is uh, adding annotations, because one of the problems that GDScript has is that it has way too many keywords. It has lots of keywords. And those keywords prevent you from using those uh, pieces of text in your in your code. So right now we have kind of a hacky situation where we allow you to use those keywords uh, in the code, but it's kind of hacky, right? Uh, so the idea is to like, for example, things like export on ready uh, tool, maybe I don't know. Uh, many of the GScript keywords, uh, we're going to add like an ad at the beginning, uh, so they are more like annotations, and only the actual code block uh, like func, if, else, that's going to be real keywords. Uh, this will make sure that uh, there's not really much clash between your code and, 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 and since we are at it, as always, uh, we'll probably change a few things like uh, how uh, properties are exported, which is not super nice. Current now in Godot with the set get, it kind of sucks. Uh, we're going to probably make it better. I don't know what, what else you had in mind. Uh, I was just thinking to yield as well. Uh, yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, there, there were a few more things also, I guess, that we discussed that are going to break. So what we decided in that case, that probably should be easy, uh, is to make a simple conversor of scripts from the version 3 to 4, which should manage to fix most of the issues. Also, like, for example, one thing we discussed uh, at the Godot uh, Sprint, uh, is that it's very confusing that uh, we have... Uh, the 2D nodes say 2D in the end, but the 3D nodes don't say 3D in the end. And that is confusing uh, for a lot of people uh, because you're not quite sure why this happens. So one thing that's going to be done in Godot 4 is uh, all the nodes are going to have 3D and 2D. Uh, there's going to be any more room for, for ambiguity. Uh, like, for, for example, the base 2D node is called no 2D, uh, but the base 3D node is partial. Uh, which kind of sucks. So spatial is going to be like re renamed to node 3D. For your scene data, I mean the scenes you have saved, uh, all this will remap automatically. You don't have to do anything. That will be just magic. You shouldn't need to do many changes. <laughs> Maybe uh, I already added in everything I've been doing that uh, the old properties will be converted to new properties. So you shouldn't really need to actually change much. Uh, if something breaks, it's because it does work different, so you will have to go and change it. Uh, but this should be very minimal, very, very minimal. Uh, it should be like uh, very minimal porting work compared to two to three. It should be like maybe a day of work at much uh, for, to port a medium-sized project. Uh, so I think it probably that answers kind of the question. Uh, the idea is to make it as less as a pain as possible and like what was going from two to three. Uh, I don't really remember any other con compatibility breakage, but uh, well, the navigation stuff will probably break a bit, but in general, it should more or less work. Yeah, everything we discussed, we we're always trying to find ways that uh, not really. Uh, we, we we knew how much of a pain it was going from two to, to two to three, and now the community is several times bigger, so doing this again is probably not a great idea without a plan. So uh, that's that's going to be it, I guess. We have a bit more time for questions if you want, but we probably should go to the next talk. Yeah, probably a shorter answer. Uh, for now, we have a, sh a big uh, loss of performances with uh, lightning when adding uh, a light uh, with a shadow, uh, specifically when we use it in uh, VR. Uh, with Vulkan, would be would it be uh, better for performances uh, concerning this kind of uh, simple thing like uh, shadow lightning? Uh, 
shadow mapping itself from the shader point of view I think is pretty optimal because of three already what is not optimal is the uh, the CPU part which generates the the shadow maps uh, because it needs to like do cooling for all the shadows every time it's going to render so there are a few well quite many optimizations plans to improve shadow map I think shadow mapping is more CPU bound than GPU bound right now than Eco.3 so the idea is uh, one of the things of using Vulkan is that you are less CPU bound but also the code will be changed to be more to me making more use of uh, parallel computing just to do all this work at the same time without so yeah the shadow performance should improve uh, we also need to add some options for example if you have lights uh, that are going uh, beyond certain distance uh, just disabling the shadow we don't have that currently oh well that's another thing we're going to add in Godot 4 which is finally a uh, level of detail uh, this is one of the reasons why using 3D uh, lacks performance. Probably there's a kind of a misunderstanding that most people think that Godot is slow because of the lack of occlusion cooling. That's not true. Uh, the main reason why it's slow is because of the callback overhead in, uh, in OpenGL and because of the lack of LOD, pretty much. Uh, if we fix those two things, even on very large scenes without LOD is going to be really fast. I mean, uh, that, that shouldn't be much of a problem. We are going to add some occlusion cooling options for, but they are for very extreme cases, like very large interiors or very large ex exteriors, but for regular games, that really doesn't make a difference. I mean, it's just not worth it. So, so yeah, uh, I think it's going to improve performance quite uh, considerably. I hope uh, that that's for now my, my point of view. So, okay, are we okay? Yep. Thank well, you. Thank you, everyone.